Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Ask a Geologist web series. Uh, so today we have Michael Monzon, who is a master's student in Rutgers Entomology Department, and he will be speaking about bugs from the crypt, archaeological entomology. So without further ado, Michael, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's uh, season finale of Ask a Geologist. My name is Mike. I'm a master's student in the graduate entomology program. Um, some things about me are I love to read action and adventure novels like the ones written by Clive Cussler. In my lab, what I mainly study are beetles and flies. And my favorite mineral is uh, Bismuth, which you can see right here. I like it because it uh, naturally forms these cool colors and shapes. So uh, in today's talk, uh, Bugs from the Crypt is about a specialized field of insect science where we use um, ancient insect parts to, um, to tell a story about the past. So first, we're going to do a little intro about insects and how they're used in archaeology. We'll go over some of the most common types of insects that are used in archaeological investigations. And finally, uh, we'll, and then we'll take a look at some situations where insects have been used um, to study the past. And then finally, we'll take a little look at some of the tools of the trade that are, are used here. So let's get started. Um, entomology is, a, uh, is the science of insects and related critters. Entomologists usually study insects like bees, termites, stink bugs, houseflies, and ants. But some entomologists actually study uh, related animals like spiders, ticks, mites, centipedes, sometimes even crustaceans and types of worms. So basically, if it's a creepy crawly, entomologists study it. Most insects have hard exoskeletons, meaning their skeleton is actually on the outside of their body. But an insect exoskeleton isn't one solid piece. It's actually a many plates that are held together with uh, softer skin-like parts in between them. The key word to know here is chitin. Chitin is the protein in the exoskeleton that makes it so hard and durable. Chitin is so durable that some insect exoskeletons can survive for millions of years, and they're pretty good at helping along the fossilization process too. In places like dirt, rocks, and lake bottoms, some insect exoskeletons can last for about 2.3 million years, and we call that time period the quaternary period. So remember, insects have hard exoskeletons um, that are made with the protein chitin. Some are some really durable exoskeletons can last for about two million years in some environments. Now, before we go any further, I know what you're imagining. You, in your mind's eye, you see an archaeologist pulling out whole beetles from mummies in ancient tombs. Unfortunately, it's very rare that you're going to find a whole insect. Even though the insect exoskeleton is very tough, those skin-like parts in between the plates will decay when the insect dies. And that means that the plates will kind of fall apart. And instead of having a whole beetle, what you end up with is uh, kind of like a pile of beetle bits. And we kind of see a pile like that on the bottom right. So for example, all we usually end up with are the heads and parts of the thorax, like the hard shell-like covering over the wings. Another common insect part that we find are the pupae of flies. The pupae right over here, this shell-looking thing, um, it, the pupae of the fly is kind of like the fly's version of a butterfly cocoon. 
most flies have a life cycle kind of like a butterfly that start with an egg. The egg hatches into a larvae, kind of like a worm or a caterpillar. That larvae feeds and then eventually finds a safe place for it to turn into a pupa where metamorphosis happens. And then an adult fly kind of crawls out of the pupa after metamorphosis. So what about archaeology? Archaeology is a way for us to physically study the past. So, for example, by studying ancient objects, both man-made and natural, archaeologists study where those objects were placed and the impacts those objects had on ancient people. So, um, if you were here for our last topic, my friend Sophie talked all about archaeology. And so, you should definitely go back and check out the recording if you weren't here for it live. There are lots of different specialties within archaeology. So the ancient objects that I study are insect fragments. So why, why are we going to study these insect bits, these insect fragments? One of the big questions in archaeology that archaeologists think about is how happy and healthy were the people that they are studying? And I think that's where I can help in two ways. The first is by using ancient, is by using the insects as ancient weathermen. Does weather affect your mood? Are you happy when it's super hot or it's super cold? Or do you prefer the weather when it's just right? Insect evidence can give us clues about ancient climate patterns and the specific in the specific locations that an archaeologist is studying because most insects have a favorite weather. In some cases, the insect parts can give us clues about the season about of when a person or an animal died. And this has to do with weather too. And just like most insects have a favorite type of weather, they also have a favorite type of season. The second big way that I think insects can help in archaeology is to study ancient pests. We can wonder about how weather affected the happiness and the health of our ancient people, but there is a lot of insect. There is <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, ancient people had dealt with pests for a long time. So <clears throat> um, we kind of know this, right? We don't want a worm in our food or like the apple that we buy from the store or fleas on our dog or lice on us. And our ancestors were the same way, but they actually had a lot fewer ways to combat pests than we do. On the left, we see a microscopic picture of a piece of flatbread from ancient Egypt. Yes, it's that old. And it was found with a mummy. If you look really closely, you can see a biscuit beetle inside of the, the flatbread. And that's a common pest both in ancient Egypt and in the modern world. So remember, in archaeology, we can use insect evidence as clues about weather and about pests. Let's talk about pollen for a quick second. We can see from the many different kinds of pollen on the right that plants, <clears throat> we can see that there's many different kinds of pollen that are made on the right. And we know that plants can't usually move by themselves. And so their pollen has to be carried by the wind or other animals. Now compare that to insects. Insects move themselves. In fact, along with birds and bats, insects are one of the main group of animal pollinators. So how do they do this? Most insects fly, just like the beetle on the left that we call a lightning bug or the other beetle that we call uh, a lady beetle. Um, the ability to fly means that insects can try to find uh, a new habitat that is just right for them. For many years, archaeologists relied mostly, mostly on um, pollen to tell them about the ancient weather. But since insects can move around like this wasp right here that's covered in pollen, insects can try to find their favorite habitat when and with their favorite climate. So I argue that insects should be used in archaeology just as much as pollen. Let's talk about pests that don't fly really quick. I said that most insects fly, and that's true. But there are some main people pests 
like fleas, like the fleas that are pictured right here that have lost their wings through evolution. Insects like lice, like the louse pictured on the bottom right, and fleas spread from host to host. And before we had pesticides to kill them, if your family had lice or bed bugs or fleas, you probably just had them forever. So they spread from person to person or animal to animal, but how and why do archaeologists study these pests? Just like our ancestors, just like today, our ancestors were often buried in their favorite clothes or with some of their favorite possessions. And pest insects can hide in these clothes and on these possessions. Protected inside of clothing and buried in the ground, bits of pest insect exoskeleton can survive for archaeologists to study them so that we can better understand how pests impacted those people's lives. Let's talk about how we use these insects. So to find our, our ancient or fossil insects, we can go to a few different places depending upon what we're studying. I mentioned lake bottoms before. The larvae of the tiny <clears throat> flies we call midges, the larvae is this red worm looking thing right here, um, spends, most of its, uh, spends the larval stage inside of the water. The adult is this kind of like mosquito looking fly and both both the adult and uh larval fragments can be found at the bottom of lake beds and that can help us find clues about the ancient weather in that area different kinds of sand or dirt yes there are different kinds of soil often plays a big role over on the right you see this lady sieving and most of you have probably seen one of these um, so she seems to be sieving some or sifting some flour or sugar, and we can sieve sand or soil to look for little insect bits. Mummies and the remains of humans um, and our, our livestock and our pets have often been found with different uh, insect parts found around them, like the beetle bits and fly pupae and insects and all the other types of things we've already mentioned. If you were an ancient warrior, you might have been buried with your sword, or if you were an ancient wealthy person, you might have been buried with a belt buckle, like the piece of a belt buckle we see here on the left. So this belt buckle, we can see the imprints, the um, where fly pupae were laid, well, where fly pupae were. So the fly pupae left chemical imprints, kind of like a, a shadow image of themselves um on this belt buckle and they'll do this on other metal objects like swords and coins so um archaeologists have been so when when people are buried with these types of objects um the <clears throat> sometimes you'll have these imprints on them um so and the reason that is is because when um as the, the fly larvae is going to pupate, it leaves its food source to find a safe place to pupate, to become a pupa. And those imprints are a result of um, a chemical reaction. So let's talk about some specific instances. We don't know much about the ancient Moche people that lived in the Andean Plateau. But what we do know is that flies and their maggot larvae were very important to them. And they were a big part of what we call their cosmology or their spiritual view of the wider world. In their pottery and in their art, we can see people dancing with flies. Here we can see a copy of some moche art on the right. It is believed that the moche believed that the flies carried people off to the other world. And here we can see a single fly watching as people dance. Some archaeologists study bones, and those scientists sometimes have to look at look for different uh, bone diseases or abnormalities that ancient people had. But wait just a second. Not all of the abnormalities that we can observe on ancient bones are evidences of disease or, or disabilities. Scientists have realized that insects like ants, termites, and beetles, and other insects sometimes feed on bone that is buried and decomposing in the earth. On the left, we see a bone that was found at that same moche site. And that little hole that you can see there is actually the result of a termite feeding. And the termite actually like burrowing into the bone. 
Let's talk about the tools of the trade really quick. So there are different tools that can assist you when you're studying and looking for ancient insects. And I'm just going to go over a few of the main ones that um, we use. So on, on the left, we see someone at the beach using a sieve. And the act of sifting dirt and looking for insect bits is usually one of the first steps you're going to take when you um, are going to be looking for ancient insects in your archaeological site. Believe it or not, there is a good amount of Elmer's glue that's used. Elmer's glue uh, dissolves in water, and so I can use the glue to mount the insect fragments onto little pieces of cardstock, like in this diagram. So instead of a whole insect, you'll have just like the little fragment of an insect. And the Elmer's glue won't damage it, and I'll be able to separate that piece from the cardboard if I need to. A dissecting stereo microscope like this one is often used to kind of look for insect bits in the rest of your dirt or the, the whatever is remaining in your sieve after you've sifted. Um, if you have the equipment at your lab or your university, you might use a scanning electron microscope like this one. So um, you can see here, this is what some insects look like that have been been observed under a scanning electron microscope. Pretty cool, right? They're able to take really, really detailed pictures. And finally, uh, technology is getting just getting to the point where we can do DNA tests on ancient insect bits. And it's very hard to get usable DNA from ancient insect parts that have been like hanging out in like the dirt, like buried, you know, in the out in the environment where it gets hot and cold and hot and cold. A lot of times the DNA can degrade and we won't be able to use it. But science and technology is advancing to the point where we are getting better at being able to find that ancient DNA. And actually I'm working with a, a lab at Arizona State University that has the only, um, the only equipment set up in North America that is capable of um, doing this kind of ancient DNA work. And so in the future, being able to DNA test this uh, ancient DNA found in the ancient insects is going to play a much larger role. All right, let's have a let's have a quick recap before we wrap everything up. So insects can tell us a lot about ancient people and the kind of climate that they lived in and what kind of pests they had. We can do this by looking for certain remains like like beetle heads or the pupae of flies. A lot of times these insect parts are going to be found in fragments and we, we may use sieves to sift dirt to look for them and different kind of microscopes to take pictures and uh, analyze them further. In the future, molecular testing is going to play a much larger role in the study of ancient insect parts. So thank you everyone for coming. And um, now we're going to move on to the question portion of our uh, of our talk. So uh, thanks everybody and have happy holidays. Thank you, Michael. That was really awesome. You can open up yeah, uh, Google Doctor are questions there. Great. Um, all right, so we have some questions here. So Philip wants to know um, when people are buried in modern times, are their possessions and clothes checked for insects before they are buried? That's a really, really good question. So it really depends on um, where it is the person died or again, what the customs are in that area. So a lot of times um, here in New Jersey, when people die, they'll be brought to a funeral home where the, the, um, the, the person is, um, has some treatments that, that go on where there is embalming and um, usually flies are, and other beetles and stuff are not going to be attracted to that, um, 
initial phase where you have all that all those chemicals. But what can happen is there are special um, types of flies called uh, coffin flies, and they are specially adapted to find um, things that are buried. So they might those are going to be decomposers that find the bodies that are are after after they are buried later on. So what does a day in my lab look like? So a day in my lab looks like I get there in the morning and I have all of these racks. If you've ever been to like a Home Depot where they have plants, so they sell like nursery plants and you see the, the racks that the nursery plants come in, I have a bunch of those and they have little cups inside of them and they have, each of them has one or two fly pupa in them. And so every day I check, all of my racks, there's about 30 of them, all full of little cups of pupa. And I look to see if any of them have crawled out of the pupa and um, into the, the adult phase. And so I check, um, I check for those. I pull them out that I pull out the cups that have adult flies in them. I check to see how close the eyes are together. So with the flies that I study, um, the girl flies will have like a big space between their eyes and then the boy flies, the, the eyes will usually be like almost touching. So I check and I separate the boys and the girls and then I have empty fly boxes, like they're like little colonies, like little, little habitats. And um, I put 20 males and 20 females into each and um, those are my experiment colonies. Then what I do is I may uh, run one of my experiments. And so for my experiment, um, I take three of those fly colonies that have 40 flies each, and I put them in an incubator at like a super high temperature for 24 hours. And I, I study what happens to the flies afterwards. Um, so let's see. Um, and that's usually what a day in my a lab day in my lab looks like. Oh, then I also have to uh, get the pupa, right? So I talked about looking for the pupa, but I didn't say how I get them. So I have these other cups, these bigger cups. They're like the ones if you ever order um, like wonton soup from a Chinese food restaurant. It's literally the same um, the same kind of uh, containers. We ordered a bunch of them, and I have the fly larvae in them. And at the bottom of the cup is sand, and so when um, when they're ready to pupate, they'll become a pupa. They'll crawl away from their um, their food source and they'll they'll dig into the sand and then they'll become a pupa. And so at the end of the day, what I do is I sift all of the sand cups and I take out the pupa and I put them in little cups and I put them in racks and that's pretty much my day. So what is my favorite insect? That's really really hard. That's the next. Well, the next question is what is my favorite insect? Um, that is a really hard question because there are so many insects that I like for so many different reasons. Um, I really like, hmm, honeybees would be a good one just because I think I like honey. And I think the honeybees are really cool because um, they work together. So for a honeybee, um, the hive is the most important part. Their family is the most important thing. And so, um, you know, for example, um, they will all help each other. They all take care of like the young together. It's a very, um, really interesting setup. They're also really smart. So we've done tests where, um, we know that bees actually remember where their food source is and they're able to communicate to the other bees by doing a dance called the waggle dance where they can find their, the food source. And actually the person who discovered the team of people who discovered the waggle dance, um, won a Nobel Prize. Like that's how big of a discovery that was. So that's probably so I'm gonna say bees for right now. And actually um if you're here seeing Ask a Geologist right now, make sure you come back next season because my friend Chelsea is going to come and talk all about bees. She's really cool and she's gonna have a lot of cool stuff to say. So how many different species of bugs do I work with? Currently I work with two species of fly. in my lab. Um, the green bottle fly, um, Lucilia sericata, and the black blow fly, uh, Formia regina. 
Um, and so those are common decomposers and um, I have like lots of colonies, like these boxes of those flies in my, in my lab. I think that was a cool question. What is the strangest insect? So another question is what is the strangest insect you've ever encountered? Hmm. So there are actually a lot of really strange insects out there. Um, one example is the antlion. So the antlion, the adult looks really cool, really interesting and really cool. But the, the larvae of the antlion um, has these like huge mandibles, right? And what they do is they create a, um, they create a pit. They are ambush hunters. So they create a pit and then they fill themselves into the pit with their mandibles, their big tusks like sticking out of the sand at like a certain angle. It's called the angle of repose. And then as their prey walks by, the pit collapses and the antlion larvae captures them and then uses an enzyme to begin digesting them. So that's actually really cool. That's probably one of the strangest insects I have ever encountered. Next question is, what made me decide to become an entomologist? So I've always loved science and I've always loved uh, nature and biology. And actually, I had never really heard of entomology until I was almost done with college. And um, I was in my undergrad and I had to do a special project um, to finish my agriculture degree. And uh, one of the classes I had to take was agricultural entomology. And I loved the class. And after the class, the guy who taught it hired me. And I did my project with him over that summer. And I got hooked on entomology. And after that season was done, after that summer was done, he had a PhD student who was studying forensic entomology. And he asked if I still wanted a job. Of course, I did. So I started working for her. And I just loved it. I've, I've always been into true crime as well. Um, I love the idea that with forensic entomology, you know, it's a very, um, you know, you're, you're using science to help people. And that's really what, what drew me to it and has kept me doing what I do is um, I get to use insects to um, look at cool, like ancient things. And I also get to use insects to help people now. And that's what I really love about it. Thank you for that question. So Philip would like to know what is a butterfly's lifespan? That's a really interesting question. Um, so that's, I will say that there are many different species of butterflies and not all of them have um, this, um, how all of them have the exact same life uh, lifespan. So some butterflies like, um, some butterflies like, um, monarch butterflies, um, they actually migrate kind of like birds. So, um, what they'll do is, um, oh wait, I'm sorry. Oh, do all flies have the same, wait, hold on, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Do flies have the same life cycle as butterflies or just the species? Oh, okay. So that was really, I'm sorry. I read, I thought I, for some reason I said, what is this? Oh no, that's the next question. What is the lifespan of butterfly? Um, most, uh, well, most butterflies live, live a year. Phil did ask what is the lifespan of butterfly. I'm sorry. Most butterflies do live a year. You actually have monarch butterflies that migrate like birds. And so they'll travel down to, I think, Mexico, Southern Mexico, where they will um, live um over winter and then they'll come back um so do flies so the next question is sorry i couldn't answer that question more thoroughly for you philip um so the next question is do flies have the same um life cycle as a butterfly or just this species so that's a really good question most true flies do have the same life cycle so actually um, another example of a true fly is a mosquito. 
So mosquitoes and houseflies are actually very closely related, but mosquitoes have a slightly different life cycle where they live in uh, the larvae are aquatic. So they live in the water. There are actually a lot of different insects that have larvae that are aquatic. Their larvae spend the entire larval portion of the life cycle in the water. So um, things like mosquitoes, dragonflies, uh, mayflies, things like that are going to spend half of their life in the water. Um, so the next question is, Philip would like to know what is a butterfly's, I said, well, um, more clearly, most butterflies will live for a year. Some will only live for a couple of months. Um, so that's a bit more of a, a, a more concise answer for you, Philip. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, what is the most difficult part of being an entomologist? That's a really good question. I would say the most difficult part of being an entomologist is having patience when you have flies that are extremely strong flyers and you're trying to like catch them in the field or, you know, work with a colony and you have like flies flying out of your colony, you know, mistakes like that happen. Sometimes when you're out in the field, you go and try and catch an insect and it gets away from you. And, and you know, that that is OK, because it happens to everyone. Even the experts um, aren't able to catch, you know, catch that fly or catch that butterfly every single time. It's hard. And so, you know, actually doing field work and, and like sometimes looking for the insect and capturing it, like you'll go to the right place and it'll be the right habitat and the insect is supposed to be there and you just can't find it. And sometimes it is what it is. So that's probably one of the most difficult parts of being an insect. So the next question. Next question is, can we use insect fossils as a proxy for climate change? Like how like how microfossils and other materials are used? Um, so and what would that process look like? Um, so we sort of, um, and oh, and so then the next part of that question is, like, do species count or carbon date, species count? Like can we do a species count or carbon dating? Um, so sort of, we can sort of do that, but not as well with microfossils, um, more generalized information about the habitat and the climate can be, can be, um, usually learned from, um, observing, uh, microfossils, but, um, you're probably going to need, um, But it's not really it's it there's not a single standardized way that um that we can do that with microfossils. So our next question, oh, this is a good one. Have lice remains actually been found in cloth remains? I thought they were pretty soft bodied, so I'm surprised they would be preserved. So this was this was such a thing for so long, and that's a really good question because lice are very soft bodied. That is a great, is a great question. So lice are very soft bodied, and there was a huge before before we had better gen genetic testing. There was huge questions about when, where did lice come from, how did they spread, and that's because you know in all of these remains. Um, there was not a lot of lice fossils. However, um, there have been some studies where they were able to find lice remains in, I believe it was like Greenland, it was somewhere in the really north. So Greenland, um, other Viking outposts in like the North Atlantic. Um, 
And then I also believe they found lice remains in the Andean Plateau. So kind of like by where the Moche was, not not the Moche that I talked about earlier, another civilization. So the Andean Plateau is one of the driest places on Earth. And so I suppose that has something to do with it. It's very dry and pretty cold. So uh, we were at, they were actually able to find some lice remains there. That is a great, great, great question. That was such a controversy, not a controversy, but people were, People to do this work were searching for those lice remains for so long, and it was actually big news. And anytime anybody ever found any lice remains, they automatically got their paper published because um, as long as they were able to verify that they were in fact lice remains, like it was it was big news because of the fact that they were soft bodied and they do not preserve very well. But they've been affecting us for so long, right? Like we've known, like we've all these stories about lice. We know lice have been a plague among people for so long, and it, it was hard for us to get that concrete evidence because of their soft bodies. So that was a great question. Thank you for that. Um, do lice infect animal other animals too? So, lice. So actually, things like lice and fleas are usually super specialized. So even with people, there are two different types of, of lice. There's head lice and then there's body lice that will live in like the clothing. And there are two different types of species. And actually the body, body lice can actually, um, um, body lice can actually transmit um, some diseases. So you had in the United States, um, there was an outbreak of a disease, I want to say typhoid, in like the 1940s in the homeless populations of Los Angeles. I know it was in the homeless populations of Los Angeles. So they did this huge campaign where um, they used insecticides to um, to give lice treatments to all the homeless people and, and it kind of stopped this outbreak of this disease. So things so pests like that are going to be um, very highly specialized. And so a, li a lice that normally bites humans wouldn't be something that would infest other animals. But there are some, there are other lice that are um, pests of other animals. Um, one interesting thing is with fleas, um, so there used to be a flea for every, every animal, um, just about, uh, had their own specific flea. But at some point, the fleas that were specific to dogs, dog fleas, started disappearing and cat fleas were taking over. So um, there used to be fleas that were just on dogs, but then at some point, the fleas that were just on cats spread to dogs and we don't really have dog fleas anymore. But we don't know why was the cat were the cat fleas just that much better. Did the dog fleas die off for some reason? And then the cat fleas kind of came because there was, you know, no other fleas there anymore. Those are all questions that we're not really sure about um, right now. So there's always always something to investigate in entomology. So if you are a young scientist and you're looking for a career, definitely um, keep insect science entomology in the back of your mind. So one of my favorite people, Rhea's mom would like to know, have insects damaged any mummies in Egypt? That is a really good question. So um, a lot of times a forensic or well, not a, an archaeological entomologist is going to be working with um, Egyptologists and and other biological scientists. So they're not going to be working on mummies alone. And so I have never seen actual documentation of specific injury that was done to um, Egyptian mummies by insects. And I think one of the reasons for that is because um, the Egyptian mummies, you know, they're so processed through the, the process of mummification that I think it would be one. I don't think the insects would be as attracted to they aren't as attracted to them. And then two, I think it's harder to. Um, it's harder to see the damage um, on that type of on that type of skin because of the uh, processing. 
Um, so another thing um, that would happen during mummification is that they would use uh, a special salt called natron. And so what happens is it dries out the skin and it actually makes most pests stay away. So when we have decomposing insects, like insects on a body, um, the first insects that come are going to uh, like fresh, like, like, you know, like gooey decomposing things. So if you don't have anything that's wet, like an Egyptian mummy that was very dry, like they took all the moisture out. So it's not going to be as attractive to, um, to those, those insects. But what's going to happen is it's going to attract um, other beetles. Like, so we have what's called flesh beetles and flesh beetles, uh, dermestids, they are attracted to drier, drier skin. So it's possible that they could have attracted those. However, here's the thing. They, once, once it was, the mummy was all dried out, they put it inside the sarcophagus and then they sealed it up. So that sealed up tomb is not really going to be attractive to like the forehead flies, the coffin flies that burrow for, for, um, for their, for their sores. Um, and it's going to be kind of like, locked away from like the beetles that would like the drier stuff. So a lot of times in Egyptian, um, in Egyptian tombs, we're actually going to find mostly like pest things, believe it or not. Um, another question is, do I know what kinds of bugs are found in Hawaii? So the most common, uh, common uh, insects in Hawaii are going to be mosquitoes. Centipedes, which are not insects, but they are closely related, cockroaches, ticks, and flies. But here's the thing about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are not native to Hawaii. We actually brought them there through, um, through trade. And so actually, um, a lot of times, this is kind of sad, but a lot of times, like all, a lot of birds in Hawaii get very sick from mosquito bites. And there are lots of entomologists who are studying um, how to keep birds safe from mosquitoes. Another question is, how can artifacts be protected from insect damage? That's actually a really good question. So it, the material that an artifact is made out of actually plays a large role and where that object is located in relation to um, like the body. So if you have something that is right inside of the coffin. You know, if it's a metal object, you might get some of that metal, uh, the chemical reaction that causes the fly pupae imprint. Um, that might happen. A lot of times if you have wood, wooden items can be um, colonized by termites. Like I had that picture of that, of that bone that was eaten away by termites. So if there was something that was buried with that person that was wood, those termites would have attacked that wood as well. Um, so I don't, I don't think there, I, if, if it's buried, if it's buried directly with the body, then chances are like it is available to some kind of like insect activity, even if it's just like the pupae being like formed on it. Um, so the best way that I would say protect artifacts is by not using natural wood and not having it in a wet place and not having it directly, like directly with the, the body. A good question. Philip would like to know, what is my favorite beetle? And who is my favorite beetle? My favorite beetle is Ringo because he doesn't, um, get, he doesn't get as, as much credit as he deserves, but my favorite insect beetle would probably be the lichanid. So the, the giant stag beetle. So like the one that has like the huge mandibles. Um, and one of the reasons I love that beetle is because <clears throat> it was, um, a really big part of like ancient European, like myths and legends. So, um, 
you know, in ancient times, like people had all kinds of like legends about that beetle. And like sometimes people would even wear their like mouth parts as like a necklace as like a magical good luck charm. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So my next question is approximately how many insect parts do you find in a single sample? It can be thousands. <laughs> so like if you, I was actually working with um, uh, an archeological dig that's in Maryland and out of two, it was a, a, two coffins. Um, it was like the husband and the wife and they were like the estate owners of like that, that mansion that were there and they had been like buried on the property and there were over 10,000 insect fragments. Um, so, yeah, it can be, it can be, I would rather have, I would rather have 10,000 insect fragments and only have like five. Um, it's, it's frustrating and it's hard work. It's one of the harder things about doing this is, is locating your insect fragments, but then having the patience to go through them all. But I would rather, spend extra time to go through all of those fragments than to not have enough to work with, definitely. So have you ever traveled anywhere for your research? So, the, so far, the only place I've traveled for my research is um, Arizona. However, uh, when you are in science, one of the things that you do often is what's called writing a grant. And so a grant is money that is dedicated for a specific purpose that you don't have to pay back, but you have to win it. You have to win this money. And there are lots of different grants for scientific research. So I just applied for a grant to go to Sweden for a year where I would be looking at, um, mostly looking at like those lake midges, like those little worms that were at the bottom of the lake. <clears throat> I will probably be looking at those for a year if I win that grant award to go to Sweden. So that would be really cool. Um, my next question is, what is the research project you are working on that requires you to keep all the pupae in the lab? That's a good question. So um, I probably answered, I probably should have included the reason why I was keeping all the pupae there before. Um, so, the reason I have all those pupae in my lab is because um, what I'm doing is this experiment where I'm looking at how well the flies survive at super high temperatures. And so a lot of people have done work with um, super low temperatures and like what happens when flies are exposed to like like freezing cold temperatures, but not a lot of work has been done with super hot temperatures. And that's probably because um, it's harder to have like incubator machines that will safely go up to super high temperatures and like stay consistent and normal. And that's actually one of the problems I'm having right now. Um, so I need all of those pupae to make my fly colonies. And each colony, each time I, I do, um, one of those trials in the incubator, I have to have three colonies. So it's 120 flies. So that's why I have all those flies, those pupae in the cups is so that I can, um, keep track of when they, when they, when they come out of the pupa. So I know how old they are. And so I, I can, I can say when I write up my experiment, I can say, well, I put these flies in the incubator at this high temperature. They died because of the key not because they were old um so that's one of that's the main reason i have all that pupa in there so that was a really good question um what kinds of aquatic bugs are found in new jersey there are a lot of aquatic bugs found in new jersey so let's see we have um um the dragonflies and mayflies that i mentioned earlier um you have mosquitoes, they live half of their life in the in the water. Um, so these are some of the ones that live half their life in the water. So we have like water beetles, like water pennies, they live half their life in the water. Uh, whirly gig beetles, water boatmen, back swimmers, um, uh, Garrid, um, I don't know, water striders, that's what they're called, water striders. Um, 
ballastomatids. Um, we have giant water bugs. Those are the ballastomatids. They have giant water bugs. So a lot of times people will say like, oh, water bug. A lot of times people confuse water bug and cockroach. So um, a water bug is a uh, is usually pretty is actually pretty big. Uh, we have crane flies. They like kind of live in the water sometimes. Um, we have um, a type of uh, insect called a trichoptera. Now, if you're ever bored, this is something cool to look up. So trichoptera, when they become a pupa, they like gather around like little rocks and stones and twigs and let make their pupa out of that. And what some artists have been doing is actually keeping um, <clears throat> keeping um, um, tricop in little terrariums and they give them like little gold and, and jewels and they actually make little larve little pupa cases out of like gold and jewels and stuff. It's actually really interesting. Um, so we have also megalopterans, and that's pretty much what we have for aquatic insects in New Jersey. Of course, oh, uh, black flies also, those are kind of like, like, um, like house flies, but they, but they bite, um, <clears throat> and their larvae live in the water. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of diversity of aquatic insects in New Jersey. But of course, if you were to go somewhere like, uh, somewhere tropical, you might find even even more diversity than that. But we actually, New Jersey is actually known for insect diversity. We have a lot of diversity, especially up in Stokes State Forest, up in Northwest New Jersey. There's a lot of insect diversity, especially of fur aquatic insects. So what are the most dangerous insects in New Jersey? Spotted lanternfly. <laughs> Spotted lanternfly, spotted lanternfly. Um, and you're probably like, why am I saying this? Um, so spotted lanternfly is a new invasive um, insect from Asia. And what makes it so dangerous is that it does not, we don't have like really a, a, a safe pesticide that's going to kill the spotted lanternfly, but protect all the other insects. And now we have the spotted lanternfly coming and it's just like eating everything. Like it's not like it's just not stop eating. Like it just eats everything all the time. And so um, that's probably, I would say, top, top most dangerous insects in New Jersey. And it's because it's going to cost like it's going to cost us a lot of crops. It's going to cost us a lot of trees. It's going to cost us a lot of all of the plants that, you know, like, you know, are around. And, and that's a that's. I think that's pretty dangerous. Uh, and then I would say the number two most dangerous insect in New Jersey are mosquitoes, of course. And so um, in entomology, we say that like the most dangerous animal in the world is the mosquito. And that's because, um, you know, we have had the mosquitoes here that, that transmit uh, West Nile virus. We don't know why, but for some reason, it, you know, West Nile virus is not prevalent here anymore. Um, it was in like the 90s, the late 90s, early 2000s, before a lot of you were probably born. Um, and so, um, even the mosquitoes here, you know, don't usually transmit, transmit, um, a lot of diseases. You know, the thing that we have to worry about is like what happened in Hawaii with shipping. So we have a lot of ports, you know, we're coastal. We have a lot of things coming in on ships. And so we don't want one of those mosquitoes that does have a uh, some sort of disease to, to come in. So with that, I think we're going to end our um, end our um, presentation for today. Uh, thank you so much for everybody who came. Um, so uh, tune in next next season. We're going to have more Ask a Geologist. And thank you, every thank you so much, everyone. So before everyone signs off, I just want to say thank you again, Michael. That was really great. I learned a lot. And I think I can relate to the spotted lantern fly because I'm always hungry too. <laughs> and um, yeah, so like, as Michael mentioned, we will resume our Ask a Geologist series in mid-February. Uh, however, I do want to make a quick announcement. We will have our annual uh, Record Geology Museum open house on Saturday, January 30th. And it is our 53rd uh, open house, and this is our first virtual open house. So 
be sure to join. It's a paleontology themed. Um, well, we'll have paleontology themed activities. We have three guest lectures. Um, and so these lectures will be hosted on WebEx and live streamed on Facebook. We will also have a virtual mineral sale, which will be held via Facebook auction. And if you are interested in any of the children's activities, we have three different kinds and you can find the registration link on our website. So please pre-register for those events. And once again, so just check our website for all the details for our annual open house on Saturday, January 30th. Thanks, Michael. Happy holidays.